So today we have Dr. Jenny G um, from um, CHLA in Los Angeles. She's the Assistant Director of Clinical Genomics um, for the Center for Personalized Med Medicine. And she is going to be talking about integrated analysis of sequence variants, copy number, as well as AOH in um, genetic testing. Um, she actually presented this talk at ASHG. So those of you who were there but missed it have the opportunity to catch her talk. And I'm going to hand it over to her so we can begin. Dr. G? Hi, thank you for the introduction. And so today I'm going to talk to you about our experiences of integrated analysis of sequence variants, copy number alterations, and regions of homozygotity in Mendelian disorders and pediatric cancers. As we all know that um, there is a broad spectrum of variation in our genome, and uh, genetic disorders can be caused by different variant types. There are chromosomal abnormalities, um, copy number variants, single gene uh, level abnormalities, as well as sequence variants. If we use congenital anomalies um, as an example, approximately 25% of the congenital anomalies are caused by gross chromosomal abnormalities. 10% by submicroscopic copy number variants, and approximately 20% um, are caused by single gene pathogenic variants. There is also a group of disorders that are caused by intragenic copy number variants, uh, which is often missed by routine clinical testing. And in this paper, the group analyzed the copy number variants in gene panels for hereditary cancer syndromes and cardiovascular, neurological, or pediatric disorders. They observed that copy number variants accounted for 4.7 to 35% of pathogenic variants, depending on the clinical specialty. Overall, intragenic copy number variants were observed in approximately 10% of the individuals with a clinically significant result. So in cancer, it's also critical to detect gene fusions, copy number variants, loss of heterozygosity events, sequence variants, and structural variants, as well as other, um, other signatures, mutation signatures, expression, and epigenetics. Currently, um, evaluation for both sequence variants and copy number variants is becoming a standard of care and is expected from clinical laboratories. So in our center, um, on the germline side, we do clinical exome sequencing, focused exome sequencing, and some single, um, single gene testing. There are quite a bit of data review and analysis tools being used. We use um, custom bioinformatics pipeline for exome sequencing variant calling. We use a LISA interpret, um, previously known as Cartagena for variant interpretation. We use Alamut as an additional tool for variant review, IGV for manual uh, inspection of sequence variants. We also use mutation surveyor and sequencer for standard sequencing results review. And for copy number variants, we use Cytoscan HD array, exon array for intragenic copy number variants detection. We also call um, CNVs from NGS data. We run MLPA for single gene exonic deletions and duplication. There are also a bunch of tools that uh, we use, including CHAS, custom CNV algorithms, and even spreadsheets. So at our center, we also run focused exome sequencing analysis, um, for, we, for which we use whole exome sequencing as a backbone but the analysis is only limited to a set of genes, and these genes include the genes of clinical interest per clinical request. Uh, we could include genes pulled by patients' clinical phenotypes using HPO terms, as well as genes that are well known in association with a set of disease. 
By doing so, the analysis is generally much faster than whole exome sequencing analysis, and the analysis can be reflected to whole exome sequencing to look for disease-causing variants if the focused exome analysis is negative. For cancer testing at CPM, we have a DNA and RNA-based NGS panel testing. We call this test as the uncle kids testing to detect um, DNA variants, RNA fusions, and gene amplifications. There are also a list of tools, um, including Ion Reporter, um, custom bioinformatics pipeline, as well as a custom variant analysis tool. On the copy number side for cancer, we use cytoscan for frozen tissue and bone marrow samples. We use oncoscan for FFPE samples. In addition, we run MLPA for single gene exonic deletion identifications on the tumor tissue that include TP53, SMARC B1, and RB1. Again, we use different tools to meet different needs that include CHAS, Nexus Clinical, and Gene Marker. So the questions are, would the use of multiple tools and applications lead to loss of efficiency and cost increase? And I think the answer, the answer is yes. The second question is that, is there also an increased risk to miss or misinterpret important findings? I also think the answer is yes. I will use a few case examples to illustrate the second point here. So the first case is for a 10-day-old male with abnormal newborn screening results consistent with a T-negative B-positive NK-negative severe combined immunodeficiency disease, SCID. And the patient also had uh, hypotonia, pulmonary, cardiac, and skeletal anomalies, as well as um, facial dysmorphic features. Classical cytogenetics and the chromosomal microarray analysis were both negative, and family history was unremarkable and consanguinity was denied. So a singleton exome sequencing analysis was requested. This analysis did not reveal any clinically significant variants. There was, however, a homozygous frame shift variant detected in the JAK1 gene. So here is the IGV um, screenshot for this JAK1 variant. As you can see that all the reads showed the same variant, uh, which is a duplication of a single base pair. And this variant is located in exon 11, um, and there are a total of 25 exons in this gene. And this variant is predicted to cause loss of normal protein function. Um, in addition, the variant is absent from the population data set NOMAD. Furthermore, the JAK1 gene is depleted for loss of function variation in the NOMAD database. The PRI score um, for this gene is 1, which increases the likelihood that loss of function alterations in JAK1 are disease-causing. However, the JAK1 Gene Disease Association is not well established at the time of the um, exome analysis. There are two mouse model papers describing the roles of JAK1. In mouse models, JAK1 plays an essential and non-redundant role in promoting biologic responses induced by a select um, subset of cytokine receptors. And JAK1 homozygous knockout mice are runted at birth, fail to nurse, and die perinatally. And JAK1 heterozygous mutant mice showed an increased activation of the IL-6 JAK set pathway leading to an abnormal autoimmune phenotype. So in human, there was a single case report of um, biallelic um, JAK1 variants in an immunodeficient patient. So before this singleton exome case was signed out, there were a few questions, though. Since the variant was called, um, the JAK1 variant was called as homozygous, both parents are assumed to be obligated to heterozygous carriers. However, this is not a consanguineous family. And second question is that the redeath for the JAK1 variant was about 60, uh, 70x 
which was lower than our average coverage, but 70X is still in the acceptable range. As a routine, we run Nexus clinical tool on the exome sequencing data and a 58 um, KB deletion involving three prime of the JAK1 gene from exon 9 to exon 25 was identified. And this deletion overlaps with um, heterozygous uh, frame shift variant detected from exon sequencing, which was located in exon 11 of the gene. And this patient likely has an exonic deletion on one allele and a frame shift variant on the other allele based on the um, on the observation here. Since we had a chromosomal microarray analysis done prior to exome analysis, we did a retrospective review of the array data. Not surprisingly, the JAK1 um, gene deletion was in fact called by the software, but was not initially reported given its size. It's only 58 KB, um, its heterozygosity, and its lack of well-established association between the affected genes and the human disease. We then did a follow-up parental studies and confirmed that one parent <coughs> excuse me, carries the frame shift variant um, and the other parent carries the deletion that involves part of the JAK1 gene consistent with the compound heterozygosity in a proband for the JAK1 variant. Looking back, um, without the detection of copy number variants and sequence variants reviewed in the same tool, the frame shift variant would have been interpreted as a homozygous variant. And likely both parents would be assumed to be obligated heterozygous carriers um, for the frame shift variant, which would be a misinterpretation of the results for the family. So the lesson we learned from this case is that an additional uh, CNV calling from exome data could be beneficial in certain uh, circumstances. Um, the second case um, here is for an 11-year-old patient with a history of ganglioneuroblastoma, Hirschsprung disease, sleep apnea, respiratory failure, and seizure. Based on the clinical presentation of this patient, there was a strong clinical concern for congenital central hyperventilation syndrome, CCHS. In addition, there was a um, family history of a brother with a clinical diagnosis of CCHS, but there was no molecular diagnosis. Um, so a FOX2B single gene test uh, was performed by an outside laboratory and was reportedly normal. That was done a long time ago. Since one of the two major um, FOX2B variant types in CCHS is polyalanine repeat expansion mutations, and the assumption was that the patient doesn't have a polyalanine repeat expansion mutation in the FOX2B gene. And so the clinical care team um, sent uh, uncle kids and uncle scan on a ganglioneuroblastoma tumor sample to look for DNA variants, RNA fusions, and copy number variants. However, there were no clinically significant findings um, in the tumor. So given the clinical presentation and the family history, the clinicians sent a trio exome sequencing that includes um, proband, brother, and the mother to look for potential sequence variants, um, including to look for um, pathogenic variants in the FOX2B gene. So this trio exome analysis um, did not reveal any clinically significant DNA sequence variants that can explain the patient's clinical concerns. As a routine, we uh, use Nexus Clinical to look for copy number variants with exome data and a heterozygous um, deletion, including the entire FOX2B gene was detected with the exome data. And this deletion was approximately 73 KB in length and was also observed in the mother and the brother using the trio exome sequencing data. Since we have array data on the ganglioneuroblastoma tissue, we retrospectively reviewed the array data, and not surprisingly, the same 
73 KB um, deletion was detected in the FOX2B gene here. In reviewing the literature, although very rare FOX2B partial or full gene deletions have been previously described in a small cohort of individuals with the variable clinical findings of hypoventilation, Hirschsprung disease, and ganglion neuroblastoma. And this deletion is different from the uh, polyalanine repeat expansion mutation, mutations, which represent a common disease mechanism for the FOX2B-related congenital central hypoventilation syndrome. And the brother had a clinical suspicion of uh, CCHS, and so this molecular finding is consistent with the clinical diagnosis. The mother doesn't have um, typical CCHS phenotypes, but reduced and variable penetrance has been previously described, and patients could have mild phenotypes, including autonomic nervous system dysregulation and cardiac, gastrointestinal, and psychological phenotypes. So going back to the original array data on the ganglion neuroblastoma, this deletion was in fact not called by uh, CHET, which was used for original uh, ganglion neuroblastoma uh, array sign out. This is likely due to the total number of the probes in this region, which was less than 25, and the threshold was said to be 25 probes to call a deletion or duplication. And for this case, we could um, have signed it out as a negative exome case if we didn't use say, a combined copy number and sequence variant tool to look for copy number variants with um, exome data. And this case tells us that calling CNVs from exome data is possible, particularly in situations that when a specific disorder is strongly suspected, although we know that the accuracy of a CNV calling from exome data is not 100%, and there are um, always sensitivity and specificity issues. So now I'm going to move on to the third case. The third case is a 15-year-old male of Hispanic descent. <coughs> Excuse me, he presented with AML with a myelodysplastic features. And his past medical history included developmental delay, intellectual disability, short stature, webbed neck, uh, pectus excavatum, and white patch on the tongue. He has two maternal first cousins with a short stature and one of them with an in in incomplete history of bone marrow issues. There was no reported um, consanguinity in this family. There was a strong suspicion for an underlying genetic disorder prior to uh, his developing AML. And so previous genetic workup included a constitutional chromosomal microarray analysis and a Noonan syndrome panel, both of which were non-diagnostic. So karyotype analysis of the bone marrow sample at the AML diagnosis showed a complex karyotype with the deletions of 5Q and um, 7Q consistent with the clinical diagnosis of AML with a myelodysplastic features. We also did a chromosome microarray analysis on the bone marrow sample at the um, AML diagnosis. This demonstrated a complex um, copy number alterations, including a uh, loss of the 5Q and a uh, loss of the 7Q. And a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in 17P was also noted in this bone marrow sample. And there was a concern for a TP53 mutation with the loss of heterozygosity representing a secondary event leading to a loss of the wild type allele and a complete loss of the TP53 function. So after the uh, first course of the chemotherapy, the patient was seen to be in the morphological remission. So, <coughs> excuse me, a trio exome sequencing was sent on the peripheral blood sample at the morphologically remission period. What we found was a um, de novo TP53 variant as shown in this IGV screenshot, and both parents were negative for this variant. This is a missense variant um, occurring in the DNA binding domain of the TP53 gene. And the read-death um, 
for uh, the read depth was uh, 50 for the reference allele G and uh, 67 for the alternative allele A. So the variant allele frequency was uh, 57% in this trio exome analysis for the proband. And this is the rare variant in the general population. Only one allele is seen in the NOMAD uh, database here. And there was also some computational evidence suggesting that the variant is likely to be deleterious. This variant is also observed in multiple uh, families fulfilling uh, leaf mini or leaf mini like criteria. There are also um, in vitro and in vivo functional studies supporting that this variant impacts the protein function and may have a dominant negative effect by inactivating the function of the wild type TP53. The variant is also considered as a hotspot uh, mutation and is one of the most common somatic variants in human cancer. So it, this variant is seen in both um, germline and somatic settings. So using the ACMG variant classification criteria, this variant was classified as a pathogenic variant. Now, the question is that whether this variant is germline or somatic. We know that the peripheral blood sample was obtained when the patient was in the morphological remission period of the AML. And based on the next generation sequencing read counts, the variant allele frequency was 57%. And so this variant was interpreted to be most consistent with the germline variant. However, the possibility of this variant being a somatic alteration cannot be completely ruled out. We recommended testing of a different tissue type, for example, skin biopsy in full remission to confirm that this is the germline variant. However, we didn't uh, get a second tissue for this patient. Um, going back. There was also a uh, hemizygous variant in the SOX3 gene. Pathogenic variants in SOX3 gene are associated with X-linked intellectual disability with isolated growth, hormone deficiency, and pan hypo um, and this variant was interpreted as a variant of unknown clinical significance at the time of initial exome analysis. So due to the time constraint, I will not get into the details of the variant interpretation here for this variant. So one and a half year um, later, an exome reanalysis was requested. The figure that I'm showing here is a um, whole genome view using exome data in Nexus Clinical. And you can see that there is a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in the <coughs> 17P region. This was not known or not analyzed at the initial exome analysis because only sequence variants were reviewed um, back then in 2016 for the exome data. Um, if you still remember, the bone marrow sample at the time of the AML diagnosis showed the same copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in 17P. And this suggests that this peripheral blood sample during the morphological remission period was not um, the best sample for germline exome sequencing testing. In addition, exome reanalysis revealed a homozygous nonsense variant in a DNA JC21 gene. <coughs> and both parents were heterozygous carriers for this variant, as shown here in the IGV screenshot. And DNA JC21 is uh, involved in early nuclear ribosomal RNA biogenesis and maturation of the 60S ribosomal subunit. In fact, after the initial exome analysis, a few papers were published describing a new autosomal recessive bone marrow failure syndrome caused by biallelic pathogenic variants in the DNA JC21 gene. And here is a list of the clinical synopsis for DNA JC21 related bone marrow failure syndrome. And um, many of the features um, fit um, the patient's clinical phenotypes that I have highlighted here, including short stature, microcephaly, abnormal skin, 
pigmentation, pentatopenia, bone marrow failure, AML, etc. So why did we miss the DNA JC21 homozygous variant at the initial exome analysis? It's because the gene was not known to be associated with any human disorders back in 2016. And <coughs> is therefore not clinically reportable. And so with this reanalysis, we issued an addendum report updating the new diagnosis for this patient. We say that since the time of the original report, new studies have been published that described an autosomal recessive bone marrow failure syndrome caused by germline biallelic variants in the DNA JC21 gene. Now, going back to the question whether the TP53 variant identified is a germline variant or a somatic variant, with the new information of the copy neutral loss of heterozygosity observed in the 17P region using the B allele fraction uh, with the exome data in Nexus Clinical, the calculated um, percentage of the abnormal cell population is roughly. Uh, 56%, which was close to 57% that was observed in this patient. So if this was a germline TP53 variant, the variant allele fraction uh, would be 78% um, calculated here, which would not fit the patient's allele frac uh, 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 frequency observed in the exome data. So we also updated the exome report stating that using the copy number variant calling tool with the existing exome data during the exome reanalysis, we observed an absence of heterozygosity in chromosome 17P, including the TP53 gene, which was consistent with the prior finding in the bone marrow sample. And this suggested that there was a um, abnormal cell population present in the blood sample, and therefore the TP53 missense variant may represent a somatic alteration. We also reinterpreted the hemizygous SOX3 variant, which I didn't get into the details for the purpose of this presentation. So the final diagnosis for this patient was a germline DNA JC21 homozygous nonsense variant associated with a bone marrow failure syndrome with a somatic 17P copy neutral loss of heterozygosity including TP53 in the affected myelodysplastic and AML cells. From this case, we think that um, combined analysis of exome data, and for this case, um, was sequence variance and loss of heterozygosity, provide more information than exome sequencing data alone. There is also a significant clinical benefit of reanalysis of sequencing data considering new scientific discovery and new bioinformatics approaches. We also learned that there is a pitfall of assumptions based on the clinical information. Now I'm going to switch the gear to briefly mention the integrated analysis in a cancer setting using medulloblastoma as an example. As we know, genetic abnormalities, including sequence variants and copy number variants, help subgrouping the medulloblastomas for example, wind-activated medulloblastomas typically have monosomy 6 and a beta continuum mutation, whereas sonic hedgehog-activated um, um, medulloblastomas often have a sonic hedgehog pathway gene mutations and deletions of 9Q or 10Q. In group 3 or 4 medulloblastomas, ISO 17Q is a common genetic alteration. So for this medulloblast sample, we saw a uh, monosomy 6 by chromosomal microarray, as well as beta continuum hotspot mutation along with other mutations by NGS panel. So the combination of monosomy 6 and beta continuum uh, hotspot mutation helped us classify this tumor into the weight activated medulloblastoma. For this medulloblastoma, there was a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity of 10Q. And there was also a nonsense um, variant in the SUFU gene, which was located in the 10Q loss of heterozygosity region. Potentially, the SUFU mutation um, is the first hit, and the copy neutral loss of heterozygosity can be a second um, hit in the tumor. Again, using the 
combined information, we were able to classify this tumor to sonic hedgehog activated medulloblastoma. We also recommended germline testing for this patient to rule out the possibility of the SUFU variant being a germline uh, variant, given that this is a one-year-old patient. For this medulloblastoma, we saw a loss in the 17P and a gain, a 17Q gain, suggestive an ISO chromosome 17Q, which is commonly observed in group three or four medulloblastomas. On the NGS side, um, we saw a splice site variant in the KDM6A gene, and KDM6A is a histone lysine demethylase. And lots of function mutations in KDM6A are recurrent feature of medulloblastoma seen within the group three and most frequently group four subgroups. So same message with the combined um, copy number alterations and sequence variants we were able to put the tumor into the group three or four subtypes. Obviously, combined sequence variants and copy number variants provide more information here. So now looking at our current work uh, workflow on the germline side, depending on the clinical referral, we often do chromosomal microarray analysis. Um, when the array is negative, we could potentially move to exome sequencing and focus exome sequencing analysis, depending on the clinical uh, situation. When exome sequencing <coughs> is negative or when we have a heterozygous variant in a gene associated with a recessive condition, we look for exonic um, copy number alteration. When the copy number alteration is suspected from exome sequencing data, we then could run exon array to confirm the finding. The ideal future workflow would be to integrate all the analysis into a single platform so that, you know, single nucleotide variants, small indels, copy number variants, absence of heterozygosity or loss of heterozygosity in the tumor can be detected um, from uh, one single analysis. To summarize, we think that um, copy number variance detection directly from whole exome sequencing is definitely possible, although challenges remain. We propose personalized approach to analysis and interpretation for such analysis. We also think that combined sequence variance, copy number variance, and loss of heterozygosity events uh, can provide more information and can potentially identify uh, germline cancer predisposition position from tumor sequencing. We think that the use of multiple tools and applications lead to loss of efficiency and cost increase, and there is also a potentially increased risk to miss or misinterpret important findings. With that, I would like to acknowledge our team at the CHLA as well as the biodiscovery team. Thank you very much. The presenter questions now. Um, here's a question. Uh, you are using many different platforms, uh, multiple array designs, WES, karyotyping, etc. If you could only afford to use one, which would it be and why? I'm in an institution that doesn't have the resources to do everything. Um, <clears throat> this is a good question, but uh, it's very hard to answer, really depending on the clinical scenario and depending on the clinical diagnosis. Um, um, I would say if, um, for example, for uh, a tumor like a medullo pediatric medulloblastoma, if you only have uh, one single piece of tissue that, um, you know, you don't have uh, much other, re many other resources, I would uh, first do a, a chromosomal microarray analysis to look for copy number changes because um, different uh, subgroups uh, have different copy number profile so that uh, you could at least uh, profile subgrouping the, you know, the, the, the medulloblastomas. However, if you have other clinical scenarios, um, then, um, then that would be completely a different story. Um, if you think the clinical diagnosis um, is more on the sequence side, then you would have to do sequence, um, you know, testing, um, depending on the, you know, if, if it's a 
tumor, uh, if it's a copy number driven tumor or a sequence variant um, driven tumor. On the germline side, uh, again, same thing. If it's a, if you're suspecting a copy number variant, um, you know, then I would do the array first. Uh, but if you're suspecting like Noonan syndrome, mostly are caused by point mutations, and in that situation, I would do a you know a sequence based uh, testing. So it's a broad uh, question. Um, with a limited resource, I would say look at your patient's population and make a decision on, on that. Great, thank you. Um, do you look for autosomal dominant deletions duplications by NGS? Yeah, we try to um, call copy number variations um, from NGS data, uh, although we definitely recognize that um, there, there are sensitivity and specificity issues um, on the technical side, uh, not even uh, talking about the interpretation. And so um, the good thing is that we have the exon array um, for exonic deletions duplications validated in our laboratory. So even when there is a suspected um, deletion or duplication, that is, co that is called, but we're not sure if it even it's technically uh, true, then we can um, move on to proceed with the um, exon array and to confirm or root it out on the te technical side. So um, it, it's, it's on a case by case um, basis. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, so how much efficiency has been gained and what are the cost savings in using an integrated tool versus multiple tools? This is a great question. I mean, we have so many tools as I mentioned in the presentation in the lab and often the time my computer is sucked by many tools, many windows opened here. And so um, the ideal, I mean, we're still evaluating, you know, trying to see whether there is a way to combine all the analysis into a single tool, and that's how we are evaluating Nexus Clinical. And I think uh, this is going to be an ongoing um, process, and um, hopefully we can share our experience uh, soon in the future. Right now, we're still using different tools and to meet different needs, uh, depending on the testing itself. Great, thank you. How do you balance analysis time and finding the answers to the tough cases? You can't spend hours on every case. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, yeah, it's hard to balance out, but for cases with a strong suspicion that you, that I feel that I'm missing something, even um, when I don't see a variant, you know, that can explain the clinical scenario that I really strongly suspect if there is something that I missed, then uh, this, definitely, this is definitely one of the situations that I would proceed to do more, uh, for example, copy number variant um, analysis on the limited exon data or NGS data to look for um, potential things that I have missed. Um, in that case, I think it's worth to spend uh, more time, and in both of the cases that I presented today, it actually didn't uh, cost much more time uh, to do this uh, additional analysis if the, you know, the, the, the informatics tools are already set in the lab and the algorithm already set up in the lab. Um, the analysis time really doesn't um, cost more. I, I would say about you know, uh, varies it about half an hour additional time, and uh, you get an answer. I think that's worth it. And then sometimes even with additional analysis, you still don't um, find an answer uh, in situations like a heterozygous variant in a recessive gene, and uh, you, you that fits the patient's phenotype. And and then I think that I. The, the re reasonable next step is to look for additional variant that potentially is missed. And so you could do a little bit more analysis to provide an answer. Um, so depending on the situation, I, I would definitely, um, you know, uh, in certain situations, I would do more. And in uh, certain situations, if you feel uh, this is a negative case um, without any suspicion of missing something, then I would not do a much more additional analysis. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that's it for our questions today. I want to thank um, Dr. G for the presentation and everyone here for attending. 